Um, and what a lovely segue into um, David's uh, presentation as well too. Lovely to have you with us, David, um, where we're focusing now on uh, ethics and uh, bias um, as well too. So David Leslie is the Director of Ethics and Responsible Innovation Research here at the Alan Turing Institute. Um, and also the uh, Prof of Ethics, Tech, um, Technology and Society at Queen Mary's University as well too. So um, David, it's over to you. We've looked at the mechanics of uh, the, the, the maths behind it. So now let's look at the ethics behind it as well too. Thanks, David. Sure, perfect. It's great to be here. Uh, it's nice to see you, Alicia. It's, it's also nice to, to have an audience of um, those who I'm, I'm not familiar with. So uh, welcome and, and please, uh, uh, my email will make my email available. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, bigger picture questions after the presentation, you can always feel free to reach out to us in the ethics part of the term. So um, I will go on, I think I, I will go on for maybe uh, 30 minutes or so. Um, and then I'll take questions after I'll, I'll uh, let me share my screen. Uh, share my screen so that uh, we can get started. Let me just okay. Let's see. And so, um, are you seeing? Are you seeing the? We're seeing all three things. Okay. Let me see about that. How about that? There about you go. That's better. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, very good. So, um, so what I'm what I'm going to do today is I'll I'll kind of offer you a um, a kind of aerial view, if you will, of some of the issues that uh, we really need to think about in AI ethics um, and governance. Um, in particular, I'm going to talk a little bit about how a starting point in thinking through um, AI harms is a really important. Um, strategy to, to, to unpack the sort of ethical or normative moral concerns that we have when it comes both to deciding on, you know, how we're going to steer the direction of travel in the choices we make about engaging in innovation, but also more practically, how we're going to make sure that we're able to operationalize um, certain principles in processes of designing and developing the system. So uh, practical principles like safety, reliability, robustness, um, fairness, transparency, accountability, and the like. So we're going to sort of take, try to go through, do three lenses, right? The lens of harms, the lens of big picture values, and then the lens of, of practical principles. So let me start with um, uh, the issue of AI harm. So a good, a good uh, uh, place to, to sort of um, open up the conversation is to ask the question of what is AI, and, and I, I saw the previous um, presentation uh, really underlined an important point that this is a really ambiguous and difficult enterprise about defining AI. Um, what we try to do in, in ethics is to, is to take a kind of deflationary approach to it. So we, we really like to think of, of AI as kind of an umbrella term for a range of algorithm-based technologies that perform tasks, solve problems, and achieve objectives um, by carrying out functions that normally require human intelligence. So really this definition is, is telling us that we need to look at you know, so-called AI and scare quotes as a set of techniques, if you will, a set of mathematical um, tax or strategies to uh, approach um, issues that have previously required human cognitive intervention. And so we need to really think functionally about it rather than to try to you know, define intelligence or talk about you know, bigger pictures of, of what you know, we might think of as what general human intelligence is. No, we need to start by being very, uh, I think, grounded and, and thinking about these as mathematical uh, techniques, probabilistic techniques, and you know, basically software engineering. So uh, where do we begin uh, when we think about AI ethics in general? Well, I, I think the best place to start is, is to really think about what um, AI ethics is not. So le let me just show you here. Uh, this, um, this is, uh, a, a, this is a, 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 the results of a recent search that, that was done on, on as, we, as we see Google. Um, so, so just have a look at the, the, the kind of prioritized results. Um, first, we might say ethic, AI ethics is not 
is not about shiny white anthropomorphic robots solving humanity's problem, uh, problems. It's not about glowing electronic brains or this famous kind of Michelangelo touch of God between humans and, and robots. Um, in some sense, uh, representations uh, of all of these uh, images um, problematically appear, right, in the, in, in, the, in the popular imagination about what AI is and, and obviously in the, in the Google results. Um, and really one thing to remember here is this, this is a force multiplier for misconceptions, AI boosterism and marketing, and that, that blurs our field of vision with regard to what the reality of these systems are and what the, what the um, sort of set of challenges are surrounding how they're being used in an in increasingly unbounded problem space. Um, so when, when we think of AI ethics, we don't wanna think in these terms, we, we instead want to start by thinking about um, these as technologies um, that are both um, socio-technical systems uh, embedded in fields of power and privilege and as products of human choices and complex social practices. So we need to see these as the results of human choices and complex social practices. And for that reason, they're not just techno-scientific enterprises or, 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 or systems or technologies. These are, these are socio-technical systems. These are systems that are embedded in wider historical, cultural, legal, political, um, economic contexts. And we really need to, to confront the technology that way. It's, it's I think, really the ground floor of, of um, what we might think of as a kind of um, uh, critical approach to AI ethics. So one more thing that AI is not, uh, I will, uh, just play you a, a little excerpt that might be might might um, pluck a few um, strings of familiarity in your brain. But let me let me just play this for you. Hopefully, it'll come through clearly. Machine intelligence is the last invention that humanity will ever need to make. Machines will then be better at inventing than we are, and they will be doing so on digital timescales. Now, a super intelligence with such technological maturity would be extremely powerful, and at least in some scenarios, it would be able to get what it wants. We would then have a future that would be shaped by the preferences of this AI. There are several technological capabilities that could form the basic elements of a workable ASI. The cognitive element to the AI would be much like our own brains. These elements would not only have the ability to learn and comprehend, but also the memory to store all of that knowledge. The ability to think could include morality ethics, rational thought, artistic creation, scientific experimentation, and especially the ability to work with logic. Another important element is the ability of human-like emotional responses, reason, and to communicate in terms meaningful for human beings. Whoever succeeds in creating the first superintelligent entity, they need to make sure that this new type of intelligence is democratized, understands people, and is able to communicate with them in some way. Bostrom argues that we might make a mistake and give this new entity goals that lead it to annihilate humankind, assuming its enormous intellectual advantage gives it the power to do so. The way to avoid this mistake is to create an open system and help it develop. <clears throat> so let me just, just quickly say, I, I want to stress that you might have seen some uh, repetitive images from the Google search. Now, from a reasonable point of view, the, this framing itself is nonsense. Um, we shouldn't be thinking about reigning in superintelligence at this point. I would argue um, we really need to, to sort of set our attentions on more immediate concerns, um, such as the violate, potential violation of a broad range of fundamental rights and freedoms, the entrenchment and amplification of biases and social systemic social inequities that might uh, crop up in the in the use of data driven systems uh, and algorithmic um, decision assistance systems. So I just want to say that we should not diminish the potential scale of the problems that are presented. It is the case that already existing technologies can pr pr produce global catastrophic risks that we need to address. What we do need to do, though, is to understand that in addressing those issues, we're addressing issues that are not arising from the growth of some alien form of, of artificial general intelligence. We need to you know, understand that we are, in a sense, in the driver's seat, creating these statistical systems that are, that are building on 
uh, underlying data distributions and patterns um, rather than you know, thinking, creating, experiencing all the anthropomorphic language that you might um, hear. Just, just a, a point that I would underline. So the question then is what, what is AI ethics about? Well, I mean, first and foremost, you might say, it's about placing all impacted humans at, at the axis of choice, at the station of choice, which really determines the direction of technological change. Um, in a sense, it's about uh, enabling a critical mass of well-informed stakeholders to decide whether to the trajectories of present and future AI will veer towards um, human well-being, the public benefit, and so social and biospheric flourishing, that the types of things that um, clinical AI and, and, and health applications of AI can do. So either in that direction, or uh, the, whether the, the, the technologies are going to be um, veering in the direction of potential irreparable harm to rights and freedoms, and really the, the creation of, of certain um, risks. And here it's important to note that AI um, has a kind of dualistic character, right? It's this very same technologies that can be used, for instance, to discover um, high, uh, patterns in high dimensional data that would be beyond human scale understanding, those very same systems can be marshaled to produce disinformation and outcomes that are, are, are harmful to humans in the sense they can create cybersecurity threats or bioterrorism threats. So we need to sort of understand that this technology has a dualistic character. And one of the primary functions of AI ethics is to ensure that we are in control of, of the direction of whether it's gonna be for our benefit or, or, to, or if, if it's gonna be leading towards potential harm. So I would say in that sense, um, AI ethics is about answering these questions. So first, how will the values, interests and organizational uh, cultures and individual attitudes, standpoints and dispositions that currently drive the accelerating developments in the AI ecosystem how will these come to influence future society's forms of life and transform the identities of us as its um, warm-blooded subjects? So are we in control? How are we, um, how are our systems and our decision-making setting the direction of travel? How will the technology policies and regulations that are currently born in our lagging ethical and moral vocabularies of today keep pace with this kind of accelerating change um, that are, that's being brought about by AI and also the, the unprecedented societal challenges that are coming along with that. So just, I mean, just thinking about the recent, you know, ra rapid commercialization of generative AI, these questions are really brought, being brought up. How do we catch up with our ethical standards, regulatory and legal vocabularies to put um, proper controls on these systems? Also, how will AI systems and technology policies and regulations that govern the technologies be able to steward um, more sustainable and equitable cyber physical futures in turn. So um, one thing we also have to remember here is um, we are increasingly living in a cyber physical world where we have sensors and actuators everywhere and the scale of data collection and use will only increase um, as we become more and more kind of enmeshed in this kind of cyber physical reality. And so we really do need to think about um, how, do we, how do we make that um, sort of the socio-digital future more sustainable and equitable. And that's a really big concern of AI ethics. Um, and, and in general, this raises the question of what shape um, will our choices today um, lead the society of tomorrow to take? Um, so first, the question is, where do we then begin uh, with AI ethics? Well, uh, first and foremost, um, let me just point out an important stumbling block that we have to deal with, uh, and that, that really has to be dealt with by any AI ethics frameworks. And that's um, th this idea that uh, we, we do live um, in uh, a, a, a plural, a modern plurality of culture values and morals. There's, there's no, if you will, no universally accepted list of eth ethical values um, that could definitively provide a common starting point, right? Um, beyond uh, the negotiation between different perspectives, different cultural points of view, different um, social contexts. And so uh, one thing to remember here is that in AI ethics, because of this acknowledgement of plurality, we've had to take a more pragmatic and empirical, uh, empirically driven approach. And this is why, in a sense, we start from thinking about real world harms, right? Because, um, 
when we think about real world harms and real world problems that are posed by the systems, um, it, it, it really means that we are trying to think about the values um, that we need in order to effectively collectively respond to, to, the, to the harms that we are and the risks of harm that we're identifying. Um, in a sense, this means that the scope of the values that, that would underwrite responsible practices in AI has to be informed by the actual risks that we identify their um, use as posing. Um, another valence um, of, of ethical uh, plurality also has to be confronted right from the start in AI ethics. Um, and, and, and that's, uh, that's this, this issue that from a, an interculturally oriented perspective, we need to acknowledge um, the exclusion of non-Western ethical frameworks and dominant discourses that have shaped um, ethics and governance um, ecosystems of the digital technologies um, up to the present day, pretty much. Um, and that, that, in fact, that framing, that shaping does reflect deeper legacies of uh, coloniality um, and Western cultural hegemony that, are, that we need to be aware of and that we need to, 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 to redress in the way that we approach AI ethics. Um, and so I would just, just point out that it's important for us to really uh, start in, in thinking about AI ethics through a wide angled lens that um, sees, it sees the, the approach as inclusive of diverse cultural self-understandings and lived experience of all those who can be affected. And uh, you know, one thing that I think is happening in the, in, in, the, in the wider development of AI ethics and governance is we have uh, studies now in, in a data justice that we've done um, uh, it, it, from the perspective, from a research perspective, through the research at the Alan Turing Institute, we've got UNESCO um, also engaging a wider, um, a broader public um, that includes uh, countries in the global south, as as our data justice work did, in thinking through some of these issues. And and we just, I think, in when we think about the the multi, um, the plurality of our cultures and the and the multiculturality of our own societies. We we can we can't um, afford not to um, open ourselves to other ways of looking at that and sense looking at AI ethics and centering those voices. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I heard somebody, but uh, I guess that that was just uh, an unmute. Um, am I still coming through clear? By the way, I can't see anything. Very very. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Okay. Uh, so David, let's just one really yes. quick question. What yes. is what is um was it homogeneity on the previous Homo slide? homogeneity is that no on the previous slide yeah this one hegemony cultural hegemony right okay right so a, a cultural hegemony um we would understand just as the there there's a way in which sort of dominant um, dominant language, dominant discourse um, is assumed as being authoritative in society, right? And so, for instance, when uh, you've, you've got a culture where the options of the values that are presented are strictly hemmed in or strictly um, within the parameters of a specifically West Western cultural tradition, the options available for people to think through the, the, the say ethics issues are gonna be dominated by those views. And uh, cultural hegemony just describes that dynamic of that kind of uh, unquestioned authority of the, of the ideological system or the cultural system in which, in which one, it's a kind of unquestioned authority of, of an existing cultural system. Um, and, and so, you know, we talk about legacies of, of cultural hegemony in the AI ethics context, uh, referring to the fact that, for instance, if you look at the initial frameworks um, for for uh, computer science, uh, computer computer ethics, and AI ethics over the last you know a couple of uh, decades, the appearance of the values and the principles were all framed within the specific kind of cultural lens um, of the West of of of, of familiar. Um, say individual rights, say privacy rights, et cetera. And so that, that, that kind of, um, uh, that, that kind of uh, narrowing or narrow, narrowed kind of uh, scheme of options, that's what we would refer to as cultural hegemony. Is that, is that, does that make sense? Really helpful. Yeah, really helpful. Thank you.
yeah, my pleasure. And uh, by the way, I can't see the chat. So please, if anybody has a question that needs clarification, scream or, or just speak up and I'll stop and, and we can, I'll ask, I'll answer the questions, okay? Okay. So uh, just, I, I wanna quickly kind of zoom in to uh, some of the, the harms that we really do need to think about um, that emerge from the technologies in order to open up um, some thinking about some of the ethical concerns that, that have then been addressed through you know, current perspectives on, on AI ethics. So first um, we, we can talk about uh, the, the, the kind of potential loss of autonomy, interpersonal connection uh, and empathy that, 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 that have already been evidenced uh, in, in the way that uh, some of these data-driven technologies have you know, where the rubber has hit the road with, with these AI technologies and data-driven technologies so far. So we know that automated AI systems with the power to make or influence decisions can have potentially dehumanizing consequences for the people that are subjected to them. Um, individuals can feel disempowered in the face of seemingly unstoppable automation, um, especially when these decisions are relevant to their sense of personal autonomy. Uh, the, this feeling can be compounded um, as well, if there are few or, or no avenues in place to dispute or to contest a decision that's rendered um, in, through an automated system um, that affects their, uh, the, the, their life. Um, people can also feel, um, in a sense, reduced to statistics by the use of the systems. They can feel um, also that uh, the, the, the use of their personal data, if not properly or meaningful cons can meaningfully consented to, violates the privacy. Um, and and uh, no less importantly, um, automation uh, can result in a loss of, of empathy and human connection. I mean, we've done um, some studies uh, in, uh, for instance, the provision of uh, social care, where uh, there is a, a real perception that automation of some of the crucial decision making that's going on in, in the care of families and children has led to uh, anxiety about not having enough um, empathy and interpersonal connection in, in, the, in, the, in the way that we approach um, solving really important uh, social problems. Um, we can also talk uh, about how the use of large-scale behavioral technologies um, has, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a broader sense, uh, tended to instrumentalize, uh, tended to instrumentalize target people and to treat them as manipulable objects of, of, of prediction. So we can think here of some of the uh, sort of uh, results of, of, of aggressive ad tech, hyper-personalized psychographic pro profiling, consumer curation, forms of behavioral nudging. Um, algorithmic nudging techniques can promote the displacement of, of agency, individual agency. And, and some have argued, and I think this is an important consideration, they can degrade the conditions needed for the successful exercise uh, of human judgment, moral reasoning, and practical rationality. So the more that, um, for instance, we're, we're treated as kind of behavioral surplus in the world um, and, and steered behaviorally by nudging techniques, um, we can, in a sense, have some of our practical rationality undermined. And it's important to, to recognize that. Um, there's also uh, the issue of, of a non-consensual seizure and monopolization of focused mental activity that, that some have, have referred to as the result of this kind of attention market that's, that's happening um, in the way that, for instance, algorithms are trying to keep us on social media platforms or on our uh, mobile devices. And there have been many studies to, to, to sort of show has, how some of this, uh, some of this um, and social engineering technique has engendered forms of anxiety, cognitive impairment, and, and mental health issues. Um, I, I, I know that was really focused on the individual layer. Now, if we if we look at harms, potential harms or risks at, at a, a from a step at a, from a step up to the level of the social structure and society, we also see sex threats to social solidarity and communicative uh, processes of, of social integration. So non-consensual and opaque algorithmic, algorithmic uh, 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 pr production. Uh, so the use of systems uh, in, in ways that uh, are, are within the context of our social relations can uh, create polarized digital publics, uh, which undermine informational plurality and, and really the 
the capacity for people to come together and deliberate, del deliberatively um, determine uh, their sort of collective moral, political, and democratic life. Um, so just to say, we, you know, there have been a, a lot of studies and, and a lot of research in, in how larger scale algorithms uh, used on the internet have uh, created less um, of a, of a uh, informational plurality in our ecosystem and have, and have undermined uh, the, the meaningful democratic conversations. And so we really do need to, to be aware of that. Um, another kind of structural level uh, risk is these systems uh, uh, can, in a sense, be used for social sorting and, and also um, can be used in labor management infrastructures uh, in, under the guise of, of uh, creating efficiencies and, and uh, surveillance, work, workplace labor management surveillance. And this can create panoptic effects that induce people to modify their behavior um, on suspicions it's being monitored. And, and that can in, in, in turn deter open interactions, which, the, which otherwise would enable the development of reciprocal trust and interpersonal connection among workers and among workers in their relationship to their managers and um, among um, people more generally. And so we, we have to be aware that, th that certain social sorting algorithms and, and you know, surveillance algorithms like forms of, of uh, emotion detection, live, live, um, live facial recognition that's being used more and more, um, that this can, this can undermine uh, the kind of uh, conditions for, for human, inter, human interaction and, and social solidarity. Um, some of the more other concrete issues, uh, we, we know that poor quality and dangerous outcomes can result uh, from uh, poor data. Uh, we talk about garbage in, garbage out. So algorithmic models are only as good as the data on which they're, they're trained, tested, and validated. And, and so we really do need to, to, to be aware that inaccuracies, measurement errors, erroneous data linkage, and sampling biases across data collection um, can create harms, right? Using poor quality data has grave consequences or could have grave, grave consequences on individual well being and public welfare. Uh, there's uh, another huge issue uh, which, which uh, was earlier alluded to, and, and that's this other uh, risk of bias, inequality, injustice, and discrimination. So, generally speaking, a supervised machine learning models draw insights from existing data patterns on which they're trained. Um, and so when they work reliably, they can make accurate out of sample predictions from what they infer from historical training data. However, the problem is that the, the training data itself can not only be biased, but the underlying data, data distributions upon which the, the systems are, are basing their mapping functions can be inequitable and unfair. So um, we, we, need to, we, we need to really be um, aware that it is a priority, especially when we're thinking about health-related AI, that, that this issue of algorithmic bias, uh, uh, cascading effects of inequality are addressed in it. And um, I'll, I'll share with you some research that we've done on the cascading effects uh, of uh, inequity um, in, in AI-enabled uh, medical devices, which is uh, really kind of zooms in on this issue through the, through the, medical, through, through, through the medical use case lens. And, uh, but I would, just, I would just point out that, that we need to, to really, I mean, when, when we think about um, health-related AI and the importance of representative data sets and, and the real risks that patterns of, of bias, in the, bias in the provision of healthcare can easily become baked into data sets and can easily um, be baked into the inferences that are generated by the models and, and, and into the, those who are producing the models. Um, this is a, a, a huge priority in data ethics uh, or, or AI ethics when we think about um, the field. Um, the uh, second to last uh, risk or, or harm that I would just point out is uh, widening global and digital divides. So we all know that, that um, the uh, use of AI systems is not distributed equally between countries or even within regions in the same country. Um, there are uh, issues about accessing data infrastructure, compute infrastructure, skills and knowledge infrastructure, um, uh, even software engineering infrastructure. And if we don't address those issues, both within the context of um, countries that have regional inequality and then wider um, global inequalities, we will simply um, tend to reinforce or even amplify 
um, existing in inequities and digital divides. And so we really need to be aware of this and we need to start from a position that's uh, conscious of data colonialism. And the fact that when that term is used, it's referring to the, the kind of hardening of uh, some of the dominant um, socioeconomic relationships globally that's, that's downstream from the ecosystem uh, setup that, that you have certain companies, certain nation states that have more resources than others. And they're sort of accelerating, if you will, um, the, the development of AI technologies in, in, in unfair ways. Um, last, uh, but certainly not least, or, or second to last, but certainly not least are um, issues of data integrity, privacy, and security. So here we think about um, collection, use, and storage, and sharing um, of data, creating multiple harms, um, uh, the contextual nature of privacy and consent, and how we need to really be responsive to individual um, understanding and, and individual um, uh, meaningful individual involvement in giving their consent for privacy issues. And then uh, issues, obviously, of concept drift, adversarial attacks, and data poisoning that can call into question data integrity. Um, and then really finally here, the final risk um, I'd point out is biospheric harm. And so um, right now we're experiencing uh, a lot of, of compute being dedicated to scaled AI systems. This is having increasingly uh, increasing environmental costs and water resource costs. And so we, we need to uh, really be aware that uh, we, uh, the, the issues of biospheric integrity are a priority as we think about now um, how the, the sort of downstream um, impacts of, of, of the use of these systems um, will uh, uh, resonate or, or reverberate into the, the domain of planetary health. Um, so I, I'm, I'm aware this, this will be 30 minutes. Uh, I will, let me just quickly take you on a quick tour of the rest of the slides, which I'll make available through Alicia so you can kind of have a look um, at the, the rest of it, and then maybe we can just talk about some of what I have just presented. So um, really quickly, uh, you'll see on, this, on the slides that uh, then I, I'll go through um, AI, the, the kind of framing of AI values um, and how these emerge um, originally from human rights and, and uh, bioethics contexts. Um, I'll, I'll then, uh, in, in the slides you'll see, uh, I've, I've just provided uh, two frame, sort of framings of some of the important AI ethics values, one that comes from our own research at the turn called the sum values, that's part of the national AI ethics uh, and, uh, safe and safe and ethical AI uh, public sector framework that we wrote. And then also some of the GPAY principles that in integrate um, data justice concerns. And I, I won't obviously go through these, but the sum values are intending to support underwrite and, and motivate um, the way that we steer the direction of innovation. And so um, what you'll see uh, in the slides is these are respect, connect, care, and protect. And then you'll just get a, a nice description of what each of those contain and how they relate to fundamental rights and freedoms. Um, and and uh, you'll also get the two of the GPA principles that come from wider intercultural conversations of what's missing in AI ethics. So thinking about, for instance, uh, interconnectivity, solidarity, and intergenerational reciprocity, and also thinking about environmental flourishing, sustainability, and the rights of the biosphere. Those are both, um, those are both uh, broader notions of, of AI ethics that are just as important. And then, and then finally, I mentioned right at the top that we've got AI values that are setting the direction of travel in AI ethics for how, how we decide on what type of innovation to engage in. But then we also have AI principles in AI ethics. And, and these are really focused on establishing the, the criteria, the, the ethical or normative criteria that need to be operationalized in the responsible design development and deployment practices in, in, in producing the systems. And so you can see here is this is just a, a version of, of what we might think about here um, when we think about what these sort of central principles are. So thinking about, for instance, sustainability and safety, um, thinking about accountability, which includes traceability, answerability, and auditability, thinking about fairness, explainability, and data stewardship. These are all Kind of operationalizable set, sort of pr principles that when we're when that when when we're writing the more practice based um, governance frameworks in AI ethics, these are what we draw on rather than the bigger picture values. So I think what I'll do is stop sharing there.
Um, Thank you, David. Thanks, David. Um, that was uh, uh, really fascinating and covered so many different aspects of um, of ethics and biases in, in AI. There's a question, uh, Beatrice put in a question about subgroups and or a channel. There's um, uh, an, another interest group where that has a focus on health equity at the Turing, so I can put the link into that. And there's also NHS England has a focus as well on um, eth an ethics initiative. So I'll put the link into that as well too, Beatrice, if that helps and others. Um, and then there's a question there from Sam about um, reflecting on um, the ownership of patient data and where it should be stored, who has access, and that these ethical issues have existed before the development of AI. Um, you know, I was reflecting on nudge theory as well. We use that a lot in, in public health as well. Um, so, yeah, some of these issues exist before the AI in the terms of digitization and how, um, how that might reflect um, the particularly in a patient setting. If a patient's telling a, a history um, and they're aware that that is feeding into an AI tool, then that might impact the, the data that they're providing. Do you have a view on, on those aspects, David? Yeah, there were a few questions in there. I, maybe I'll, I'll start with the, the, the ones on, on, on data and the kind of pre-existing dynamics that, that, are, that were applicable before we started to really talk about AI ethics. So th this is absolutely the case. I mean, we've had um, issues around sort of data, data quality, data privacy, data protection, um, predating the obviously predating the GDPR and predating a lot of how we talk about um, th these issues now I think if anything um, what we what we need to recognize is um, one of the one of the benefits of AI of, of, of the centering of AI ethics is that we're able to put a magnifying glass on some of those those issues that might not have been thought about um, holistically before um, so for instance, now, uh, when we think of uh, sort of the, the data stewardship dimension, so the, 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 the package of, of issues around data protection, data quality, data integrity, data privacy, um, we are increasingly thinking holistically. We're thinking about how the data is part of a, a wider kind of eco data ecosystem, and there's a data life cycle that's integrated um, into, the, into the, the data analytics kind of process and data analytics life cycle, which is the AI life cycle. And so what I would say is um, we do need to think of this evolution in an evolutionary way. And that as we have you know, gone beyond just thinking about data to thinking more specifically about data in its journey through the analytics life cycle and, and in the wider kind of ecosystem of, 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 the, of data innovation, um, we're simply uh, able to um, be a little bit more sophisticated about how we approach these issues, right? So it, seeing these things as, as continuity is important because then we're able to identify, you know, what we're missing and, and, and where we need to go. But um, we do need to think of it as, 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 a, as a learning process and especially with nudging, right? So, so clearly nudging techniques have, have been around for quite a long time actually and, and algorithmic nudging has, has been a technique as you mentioned in public health for, for a long time. Um, that being said, uh, you know, we, there, there have been important ways in which the debates on AI ethics and, and the, de the, the debates about the scaled nudging that occurs in ad tech and in the use of, of these systems, um, not necessarily for the public benefit, right, but to optimize the bottom line of big tech companies, how oh, an awareness of that really brings out issues that we need to be um, conscious of, that autonomy matters and individual choice matters. And we can't paternalistically just think we can nudge society into better behavior, but we need to understand that, you know, people um, need to be um, agents in, in the life decisions that they're making. And um, if anything, that's an opportunity to improve our own self-understanding and our democratic practices that, that's opened up by, the, by, by AI and uh, that's opened up by kind of thinking about AI ethics in, in that context. So, I would say that you know we need to be careful with that. We need to you know make sure that we're um, kind of yeah approaching it that that in that in that sensitive way. Fantastic, thank you, David. Um, I um just a, a fantastic presentation and a whistle stop um tour and the um 
the different frameworks and um, the guidance that you were pointing to, I'm sure we can find them and, and people have links to those as well too. Um, just a point from you, David, and then we'll go to a break. I'm just interested in what's your take on is the future of ethics of AI um, in this space? Does it, does it, uh, is it a balanced future or are you more in the, um, actually we're, uh, does it look good i suppose is what i'm trying to say are people becoming more aware of these issues and challenges or or do you think there's still a tremendous amount that we need to do to to start in that direction yeah i mean i think we're at the very beginning of, of a much longer um journey here and i think that the 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 difficulty that we're facing right now is we've got such a rapid um you know uh, advancement of of industrial applications in AI, especially with the gen this kind of you know ChatGPT moment and the generative AI moment, that we're we're recognizing um, from in in I think some of our some of the critical data studies and ethics communities that regardless of 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 how one kind of approaches this, thinking about the the necessary steps to be taken to sort of advance the governance ecosystem to advance awareness even among those who are um adapting uh, adopt adapting applications of the technologies that we do face a really big up, uphill climb when it when it comes to really um being um you know in a sense you know catching up to the way society is using the technology and i i think we i would just caution against being too deterministic here because you know we can be deterministic in the sense of thinking the technology the horse is out of the bar and the technology's just gotten away from us we can't you know, effectively apply, you know, bias mitigation or, or you know, the various other um, AI ethics approaches that that have been relatively well developed. I think we can't we can't throw our hands up. Um, and so I think the starting point is is you know in holding summer summer classes like this. Oh, I should tell you the truth because we we simply need more and more people to be aware of the socio technical issues um, in in order to sort of put the brakes on certain conversations. Um, that are happening because you know they, they the interests of those in the in the kind of commercial side of it are very very powerful and um and they they can come to dominate public um communication about these things and so you know i think the hard work is what 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 we need to do in, in our everyday engagements of of impacted communities Lovely. Thanks, David. Um, I think we're all with you in, in that space. So um, it, uh, lovely, lovely to hear. Um, and by this in itself helps to helps uh, everyone on that kind of start of that journey as well, too. Um, thank you once again to David. Thank you for all your uh, questions as well and thoughts people put in. What we'll do, I know we're running a little bit behind on the time 